Hello. Nice to see you guys this afternoon. Thanks for coming. It's funny, the topic of trust in the news is getting um, trendier by the day. And that's not a good thing, right? I've been working on this for a few years. And when I started, it was definitely something people were interested in, but it didn't, didn't feel like we were quite at the crisis point we are at today. And what I want to do is um, talk about, sort of lay the groundwork for that crisis point, remind, remind ourselves what we know about how little people do trust the news, and then talk about what a whole bunch of us around the industry are trying to work on to improve that situation. So as we remind ourselves why we're here, this is the journalist creed. I used to teach at the Missouri School of Journalism, and this was written by the founding dean of the journalism school there in 1908, Walter Williams. I believe in the profession of journalism. I believe that the public journal is a public trust, that all connected with it are, to the full measure of their responsibility, trustees for the public, that acceptance of a lesser service than the public service is a betrayal of this trust. I've been fortunate in my career to work in newsrooms where this felt very true where I worked with journalists who believed that what we were doing was, was crucial for democracy and that, of course, we were working on behalf of a community that desperately needed what we had to offer. Unfortunately, that's not true in all newsrooms, and unfortunately, it is far from the impression that a lot of news consumers have of this profession that I've worked so hard to be a part of. Trust in news has actually been falling for decades. This is not a brand new problem. It's easy in the last few years to feel like it's a new problem. Trust actually peaked three years after Watergate, as all these people, you know, Woodward and Bernstein sent people to journalism school, and they also instilled in the public the idea that journalists were looking out for their best interests. In 1976, 72% of Americans said they had a great deal or a fair amount of trust in the news. It had fallen to the mid-50s by the 1990s. In September 2016, it hit a new low of 32% of people saying they had at least a great deal of trust in news. This figure resonated with me for the first time based on the work that Todd and Lisa are doing here uh, with their 32% project. Just this idea of that's a, that's a third of Americans who regularly are inclined to believe what we do. 32%. So more Americans have a negative than a positive view of the media. 23% are neutral. Fewer than half of Americans say they can think of a news source that reports objectively. And I think that, that word objectively is, is one we could spend a whole hour parsing out. It's not necessarily an ideal that I think journalists should be striving for, but it's one that Americans have accepted as a sign of fairness and neutrality. Politics plays into that. Republicans are much more likely to um, distrust the news and more likely to name Fox News as their objective source. Democrats list many different, they're more diverse in their answers to that question of, of objective sources. Education also, also plays in with National Public Radio being the most often mentioned objective news source among people with the highest level of education and Fox News as increasingly an answer, a popular answer to that as education levels decrease. I just want to sit with this for a second. The most recent um, Pointer Media Trust survey said that nearly half believe the press invents negative stories about the current administration. So that's not just saying that we have a bias that seeps into our work. That's not just saying we're unfair in our treatment. That means invention of information. And that's what people think of the work that we're doing. So I don't want to get too deep into the data, but, but just here are some things broken down by party that people say they think are big problems in news. The spread of inaccurate information, owners of news outlets um, unfairly influencing the way stories are reported. That sort of funding and the influence of money is a big concern. Being too dramatic or sensational in how we cover the news. Too much bias in selection of stories. Not enough investigative journalism. The list of problems is a long one. We also know through the research we've done um, through the Trusting News Project, this might seem like an obvious thing to say, but I think it's worth pointing out that people pay for things that they trust. So the less likely people are to trust the news, the less likely they are to um, pay for that news. Also worth saying that the two factors in our research that made um, the two groups of people who were least likely to trust were conservatives and people of color, often because they say that they don't see their own lives and values reflected in the news. One of the things we're working on is um, how to help people have more nuanced understandings of what the news is, what journalism is. It's amazing how many people, when I tell them about the work I'm doing, about trust in journalism, their minds go immediately to national political coverage. 
They assume that what I'm studying is how people, how pe whether people trust political coverage, mostly, honestly, through national television. And I think it's really important to remember that the media is uh, a lot of different things. Thousands, uh, a thousand or so local TV stations, a few thousand magazines and newspapers. People mean a lot of different things by that. So at Trusting News, we're trying to address this problem in a variety of ways asking questions, sort of demystifying the idea of how people decide what news to trust, break that down into factors that we can wrap our brains around, um, figuring out how people describe credible news, what brands they trust, and, and what, would they, what words would they use in describing what those brands have in common as opposed to the brands they don't trust. What do they say they want and what do they actually want? Because we certainly talk to people who say, I just want you to give it to me straight, but really the person I trust is Rachel Maddow. Like some people say they want just neutral presentation of facts, but they want the neutral presentation of facts that agree with their worldview. So figuring out what it is people are looking for and deciding whether we want it to give it to them, that's I think very important. We've worked with about 75 newsrooms over the last couple years. We, are, we basically recruit newsrooms to help us test out trust building strategies. And I'm gonna talk to you today about some of the things we've been testing and what we're learning. Um, we also have done a round of interviews with news consumers where I've recruited newsrooms, uh, journalists in 30 communities to sit down one-on-one -on -one with people among their own news consumers to talk about how you decide what to, tr what to trust. And the interesting thing is that even like a, a weekly newspaper in Texas, when they sit down with their neighbor and reader and say, we want to talk about trust, those people start complaining about national politics and television. So figure, helping people understand what different journalism has to offer in different ways, I think, is really important. We are also um, have done some, published some questionnaires for people across the country to weigh in on this issue. And then our real goal is industry training. Our real goal is getting strategies in the hands of journalists. So this isn't an academic research project. We are enlisting journalists to help us test things, looking for patterns in what we learned, and then turning it into uh, strategies that we hope can help help mission-driven, like-minded journalists demonstrate their credibility. Luckily, there are a lot of people working on this issue. Some of them, Lisa and Todd, are in the room, the 32% project. There's a project out of California, the Trust Project, that's working on how you train um, algorithms and search engines to recognize credible information. Um, there are a lot of really good organizations working on this problem from a variety of perspectives, and we need all of it desperately. So here are some of the things in our user, in our interviews with news consumers, here's some of the things people said they want. Probably not a lot of this will surprise you. I want quality journalism, which includes multiple sources and opposing viewpoints, and is also ambitious in scope and offers context. Many of these things you'll notice are not things people would disagree with. Like find me a journalist who says, no, I don't want to be ambitious in scope. No, I do not want to offer context. These are pretty positive or neutral statements. But people say that that's what they're looking for and obviously many of them don't feel like they're finding it. Another user says, I just want the facts from both sides so I can make my own decision. Let's pause for a moment and recognize that there are usually more than two sides. So anytime we say both sides, we're automatically putting people in buckets and that's a problem. Um, I used to be in the military, so I'm very knowledgeable a lot of, a lot of, about a lot of issues. I can tell what's a fact and what's not. Bad journalism is willfully, maliciously biased. We're gonna talk about bias more in a minute, but I don't think we'd find a lot of journalists who are willfully, maliciously biased. But those sorts of journalists pick and choose what they report because it is part of a greater plan to sway public opinion. People genuinely believe that, that there is a media conspiracy to sway public opinion. Here's a user who is interested in hearing about how stories are built behind the scenes. She wants us to get together and build some sort of equivalent to the American Medical Association. She wants like a checklist, like a nutrition label really, like this counts as quality journalism which I think is a wonderful idea. It's problematic given that we have no certification process for being a journalist. There's no license. Nobody gets to decide who's a journalist and who isn't. So monitoring um, would be tricky. But the idea, I think, is an interesting one. Here's a news consumer who wants transparency, especially around funding. She wants to know how, where money comes from for news and how that does or doesn't influence coverage. This came up over and over. And it's one journalists don't talk about a whole lot. Not a lot of people in newsrooms thinking, 
who's who's making my paycheck and how I know that that I know that the people paying my check aren't telling me what to cover, but we don't stop and tell people that there's a that there's a structure in place to prevent that. This user thinks it would be good if both journalists and news organizations disclosed more about themselves. If you state your bias, you can be credible. We heard this quite a bit too, that people said, um, I don't mind if you have a perspective in how you do the news, but I want you to be honest about it. I don't mind getting my news from Christian talk radio because I know where they're coming from. I know what their perspective is. The problem is when people pretend not to have a perspective and I then feel misled. We were amazed at how many people want to talk about journalism. Some because they're fans. Plenty of people want to defend journalism still. But some people want to talk about it because they're mad. But either way, the topic of journalists, for better or worse, the topic of how news gets produced and consumed is on people's minds these days. And I think we have a real opportunity as an industry to take advantage of that and to tell some stories about what we do. Here's another quote from our research, our interviews, mainstream media, because of corporate status, have an agenda. They write the article to gain money and get advertising. It's all about the money. This is a tweet from a Daily Beast reporter who covers tech and culture. She was commenting one day about the assumptions people make about ethics and being amazed at how little people understood. It amazes me how many YouTubers, she interviews a lot of YouTubers, think they should be paid for doing interviews about 40% of the time. They ask if they'll be compensated for being interviewed for a news story. And then when she tweeted that and got so much attention back, she says, oh, wow, apparently a lot of people think this. Did you guys know that? That a lot of people think that journalists pay sources? So people think we make things up. They think we pay sources. They think that when we use anonymous sources that even we don't know who the sources are. They don't understand that, that we know and our editors know, um, but we're choosing to protect their identity. You know, we don't explain it each time. And when we see things like this, we don't then do anything about it. We say, oh man, people really don't understand news. So whose problem is it? I don't think it's the YouTuber's problem. People want evidence of balance and transparency of motivation. They want to know that we're trying to be fair and that they want to know why we're doing certain stories. I would love to see a documentary inside a newsroom. I'm not sure it would be as interesting as this news consumer thinks it would be. But there are people who really want to watch the process, the story selection process, the process of how we decide who to interview. There are people who are very interested in that. Some people say journalists are trained in journalism schools to slant the news. Slant is another word like agenda that journalists don't use very often, but people use a lot to talk about journalism. This other gentleman likes that Fox includes both sides and nobody else does. So let's talk for a second about both sides and about the perception that journalists have on the world. And I want to pause for a second and recognize that journalists are becoming more and more centralized in liberal areas of the country. As more and more journalists get laid off and centralization of news is pushing people into big cities, a higher and higher percentage of journalists are based in places that are likely to have, that are likely to vote blue, frankly. So in 2016, 51%, more than half of publishing employees worked in counties that Clinton won by 30 points or more. So we're not here to talk about a liberal bias in the news, but I do think it's really important to recognize that based on who we are as journalists and what our job is and where we live, we are more likely to live in a place where a progressive or liberal sensibility is the norm than we are to live in a place where conservative sensibilities are sort of the more accepted. People talk about the news very differently depending on where they live, and we are indeed out of touch as an industry in what happens in other parts of the country. We also need to talk for a minute about irresponsible journalism. I feel like I spend a lot of my life defending journalism and it's really important and humbling for me to remember that I don't defend, I wouldn't want to defend all of journalism. There's a lot of information that's presented in ways that I don't feel comfortable with. A lot of choices that are made about what to cover and how to cover it and what tone to take with it that I think misrepresent um, misrepresent information or are disrespectful to sources or are really just showing um, a limited view of an issue. The Hill wrote a story recently about a really disturbing CNN segment. 
This happened a couple months ago. The morning, the morning hosts on CNN were doing a story about the Trump's marriage. They were actually doing a story about whether Melania was going to accompany President Trump on a trip. And they used that as a jumping off point to talk about some of the public embarrassing moments that they'd had together. And they started to laugh while they were telling the story. You know, oh, remember that time he reached for her hand and she pulled her hand away? And they were like recounting these awkward moments. And they started to laugh so hard that they couldn't get full sentences out. So I don't know whether that is indicative of how they see of their political views. I do know that on that morning, they felt it was appropriate to mock the president's marriage. So anybody who was watching who didn't share that view, that that was a really funny thing to do, doesn't have faith in CNN on that day and certainly doesn't feel like their worldview is represented in what they see. So as we step back from all of this and figure out what people want and what the industry can do in response, it's easy to go to the extremes. So I was getting my hair cut recently, and the woman who cuts my hair says, you know what I just hate about the news? I hate when, when journalists just repeat what politicians say and it's not true and they say it over and over and think that that will somehow make it true. And I was like, man, I hate that too. You know, kind of like Obama's birth certificate. And she said, well, was that ever proven? <laughs> so she doesn't trust basic facts and nothing I say is gonna convince her of that. For me and the work I'm doing on trust, I choose to sort of set her aside. I would love if the industry could bring her along in her belief in facts. I also think that it might be that she's just jumped the ship and that she doesn't represent the reasonable middle ground of people who genuinely want to be intelligent consumers of the news and are looking for guidance about how to do that. On the other side, I got a mammogram and the woman who did my mammogram found out what I did for a living and it's like, oh my gosh, that's so great. We need this so badly. Journalists are being so maligned. And I asked her, as I always do, about her own news consumption habits. She just trusts Rachel Maddow. She decided forever ago that whatever Rachel told her was right. And that, that's really, that just, that's all she needed to do to be smart about the world. So those are two extremes, right? I want to work with the people in the middle. So people at my church started to ask me questions. Joy, what do I do? I don't, this is so stressful. I don't know what news to turn to. They want to make smart decisions, but they don't know what to do. So I gave a little talk at church. Here's how to be a good news consumer. Here's what I wish people knew about journalism. Those are the people I'm talking to, the people who genuinely want to make good decisions. So here is what we are doing in response to that. This is a list of headlines from my newspaper where I live in Sarasota, Florida on a recent morning. Things to do this week, there's a balloon festival, criminal reforms aimed at racial injustice, voting on a tax referendum, drug charges, red tide in the Gulf of Mexico. So none of that has anything to do with red state, blue state politics. Little of that is likely to be accused of being fake news or of being done to further a political agenda. But when you talk to people about the news, this is not the stuff they have in mind. They're jumping straight to national political coverage. And yet, what they say they want from the news, most journalists would say, well, yeah, we're doing that. Of course, we're offering context. Of course, we're trying to be fair and represent the diversity of perspectives on an issue. People don't get what we do. And that is not their fault. If there's a void of information about how journalism works and what we're here to do, what our motivations are, what our ethics are, what our processes are, we are not stepping in to fill that. We have a storytelling problem about journalism. So we need to stop assuming that people know what we're offering them. We need to start explaining to people what we offer and how, we're, and how we shouldn't be lumped in with just the sense of the media. And we need to tell them why we're worthy of their trust and their financial support. I like thinking about trust as a budget. People have to spend their trust somewhere. You have a finite amount of trust to give. How are, how are we, what are we doing to coach people through that? You can also think about trust as, as a diet. People have an information diet or a news diet. And it's fine if you include you know, some broccoli and some Doritos, and it's fine if you turn to the, you, know, you do this every once in a while, you do this day to day. What are we doing to teach people how to have an intelligent, healthy news diet? 
So the fundamental question of trusting news is what can journalists do day to day to help people decide how to spend their trust? So I go talk to journalists about this, and they have a variety of emotional reactions when they learn and talk about just how little trust people have in them. I don't mind, and I expect journalists to be sad and angry and frustrated. What bothers me the most is when journalists say they're helpless or hopeless. When journalists say there's nothing we can do about that. All we need to do is continue to do good work, and people will find it. That's how we'll stand out, by just doing good journalism. And unfortunately, we know at this point that that is just not the case. We have to do more than that. We can't hope that our link in the middle of search results of all other links is going to stand out to people as the one that they should trust. We need to work to build relationships that are based on trust. We need to explain to people really specifically why they should trust us. To do that, we have to first accept that this is part of our jobs as journalists. And it's not in the job description of a journalist. Explain your work. Show people who you are. Be accessible. Answer their questions. You know, it can feel like customer service. Like, I don't need to explain this to you. Just take it. Just accept it. It's not enough. We have to then invest in understanding our audience enough to know what complaints and concerns they have. Being a good journalist involves listening to your community for a variety of reasons, but it also involves taking to heart and really internalizing what people say they do and don't trust about the news. And that can be really hard. It's like reading through a comment thread where all people are doing is complaining about you. And instead of just getting defensive or instead of just closing the computer, looking for patterns and saying, wow, this is six people accusing us of this bias or agenda they think we have. This is a whole bunch of people who don't understand why we have to charge for our product. This is a whole bunch of people who think that an advertiser just told us to cover this story and that's why we did it. Look for those patterns and accept that doing something about that is part of the job of journalism these days. Then we need to figure out where in our processes as journalists and where in the products we produce do these trust building messages go? If you want to explain to people why you did a story to prevent them from thinking that you did it because an advertiser will benefit from it, where does that, what, does that like a paragraph in your story? Is that in the lead in on air? Where does that go? How do you do that? Journalists are creatures of habit. And so we're, as we're, we learn in journalism school and as we learn from colleagues in newsrooms, there are structures and formats to things that are accepted and we don't know where this stuff would fit. So, and that's one of the things we're working on as well. So what I want to do now is talk you through some of the trust building strategies and messages that we're working on in newsrooms and show you some examples of what we're trying and what we're learning about what people respond to, all right? So the first thing we really work on is this idea of knowing what you as a news organization offer and explaining to people why you are different from the media. There's very little use I've found in talking about the media overall because it means so many different things. I just want to talk about us. So look for chances to explain your motivation and your goals with a story. Here's why we're doing this. Our only agenda in doing this story is to help you make smart decisions about your community. Reflect your values. Show that you value their trust. Several people in our user interviews said, just the fact that you wanted to sit down and talk to me about trust makes me trust you. They don't take for granted that we care about earning trust. How sad is that? That they don't assume that journalists care about being perceived as trustworthy and credible? That's a big problem. So say things like, like, look for chances to say we live here too. We are in this together. My kids go to the schools here. I live in this neighborhood. We know you value this. We're giving you this story because we know that you value stories like this. We know you want this situation to be improved. We invest in this type of reporting because things that seem to mission-driven journalists like they're really obvious. Of course, we're doing this story because we think it all. We think access to this information improves the health of our communities. Well, I, I think it's, it's becoming more and more clear that we can't assume that we need to tell people. So one way we're doing that is some of my newsroom partners are... Um, looking for ways to take questions. This is a TV station in Cedar Rapids, Iowa that just did a Facebook Live and said, 
it's really important to us to earn your trust. We want to know what questions you have, and we want to know how you can do better. It's the executive producer and a news director and an assignment editor. So here are some of the things that people ask. People ask questions in Facebook comments over a period about, of about 30 minutes, and people and then the journalists live answer them. This is not complicated technologically. It doesn't take a whole lot of time. It does take being willing to answer questions live. No, we don't purposefully suppress stories. Pe people ask that. They talked about their ethics. Here's how we check the facts of stories. Here's how we decide what to cover. Man, is that a huge one. Huge. People want to know why are some things news and other things not news. You know what's really hard about that is that there's no science behind it. It's a really hard thing for journalists to explain. And so we just sort of avoid the topic because we don't really want to lay out a process and be held accountable to it. Because let's be honest, sometimes what we cover is just a factor of like how much other news is happening that day and what reporters saw on their drive into work and uh, you know who's looking for a nice feature for their, pro for their portfolio. Commitment to a local community is something that came up. They looked for an opportunity to say like, hey, we live here too. Tons of people have questions about what news stations or newspapers have to cover because of their parent company. So what does your, you know, if you're an NBC station, what does national NBC send you and do you have to cover that? So they kind of talk through that process of how much decision making control and how all the decisions are actually made in the local newsroom. They talked about balance and fairness and how those aren't the same thing. You know, it's not about equal airtime. It's about making sure that, um, that you're being fair to multiple sides of a story. Talked about how investigations work and what a big, big uh, commitment they are. And then they talked about why they need viewers to help produce the news. So they covered a lot of territory in 30 minutes. And you know what? Thousands of people watched. Tons of people watched the replay later. Lots of people, hundreds of people participated in the comments. Didn't take a lot of time. WCPO is a TV station in Cincinnati. They did a similar thing, but instead of Facebook Live, they took questions kind of AMA style, like just said, our editors will be here for a couple hours answering your questions. They got a lot of the same questions and showed a really nice touch in not being defensive, um, validating people's participation, thanking them for their questions, following up when people say, oh, you guys always do this thing by asking for examples and saying, you know, I'd really, we'd love to serve you better. Can you tell me about a time we let you down on this? And I wanted to show you this one comment thread. Somebody said, when doing stories about firearms, please seek out reputable experts instead of obviously biased professors. <laughs> Darn professors. <laughs> Too many times on WCPO, I see stories talking about firearm basics that are flat out inaccurate. And you guys, this is so correct. Journalists are terrible in covering firearms. The Pointer Institute actually has a free class for journalists about how to cover guns in case this is something that's interesting to you. Um, so the news director, Mike Kanan, writes and says, this is great, thank you. If either of you know of any great experts to use, feel free to email me. So when I woke up the next morning, I had a forwarded email chain in my inbox from Mike. The people had interviewed and said, look, I know tons of people, but they're not gonna wanna talk to you because they've been misquoted too many times, they don't trust you, why would they talk to you? Ended up with a really amazing back and forth and some sources, they connected to sources who would, who would be willing to help. Mike convinced them it is our genuine desire to get this right. And that happens because they open up the invitation and say, how can we serve you better? And then they stick around to listen. Some of our strategies are around ethics and funding. Explain to people why you need their financial support. You know how a lot of news sites have a paywall? So you get 10 stories free and then you hit the paywall, right? So, so many of my newsroom partners are brainstorming strategies around what do you say when people complain about that? Why do you even bother posting the story on Facebook if we can't read it? Well, you know what? You can leave that alone, and that's what a lot of journalists would do. Or you can show up and say, wow, I'm so glad you've enjoyed 10 stories free this month. You obviously value the product. Here's how many hours it took to produce this story, and, and we'd love it if we could do that for free, but we can't. Like, show up and be present and answer some questions. Explain how the funding does or doesn't influence your coverage. You know how you'll hear, you know, you'll hear in a radio story, Somebody saying, um, you know, we should disclose that we're covering this company and disclosure, they are a funder of our product. I think we need another sentence. We need something that says, but we have structures in place to prevent that from influencing our coverage. We just assume that people make that leap. We don't explain to people that we don't want funding to influence our coverage and that's not consistent with what we believe. 
Here's how we handle corrections. Here's how we moderate conversations. We have a policy we follow. There's thoughtfulness behind it. A lot of this is about demonstrating thoughtfulness. We've thought about this, we care deeply, and we're willing to show you, we're willing to pull back the curtain and show you what we're doing and invite you to trust the process as well. WITF is Public Media in Pennsylvania. They put up a page as part of this project that says, here's how our funding structure works. We get this percent from community support, this percent from our for-profit arm, 11% comes from federal funding, and here's how that does and doesn't influence coverage. Here are the steps we take to make sure that, are, that we have editorial independence. They can now link back to this anytime they get that question in comments. Another set of strategies is around explaining the process of journalism and demonstrating balance. And balance is kind of a tricky word um, because it doesn't mean that everyone gets the same amount of attention. It does mean that it's important for journalists to demonstrate to people that they are interested and that they value and that they invest in showing the complexity of an issue and that they don't actively suppress some voices over others because of what they personally agree with. People also really want to see evidence that we are investing in our reporting. They like it when we say, this is an investigation. They like it when we say, um, here's how much time this took or here's how much work went into this, or here's what it took to fully explain this issue. We should be looking for chances to say, here's what motivates our coverage. Don't just, just, don't just hope that people recognize that you don't have a political agenda behind your political coverage. Maybe the anchors, as a lead into a story, need to say, it's worth noting that the only agenda we bring to our political coverage is helping you live your civic life and make decisions about your government. How hard is it? to say, we know you want to hear from multiple sides of a story. That's why we're bringing you, that's why you're about to hear from A, B, and C. What if that is the first sentence in a Facebook post? Or what if that's the first sentence in a newsletter introduction to a story? What if we can explain the process? We went through this stack of documents. We consulted 12 interviews. What if we say to people, um, today you're going to hear this part of a story. You might have noticed last week that we took a similar approach to covering a different perspective from the story. Often balance is something that happens over time and people pull up one story and have a reaction to the perspective represented in that story. You know, you'll take a deep dive into the developer's point of view on a story about land use and, and assume that people will remember that last week you took a deep dive into the perspective of the homeowners who are gonna be affected by the development. Well, don't just hope people notice that. And don't just throw a link in. Tell people explicitly. It's important to us that you hear from multiple perspectives on this. You might remember that last week we did this. Here's a, today you're going to hear from this. So the Jefferson City News Tribune is a newspaper in Missouri, and they have started to put boxes like this next to their stories saying, today's story is about this, um, a group celebrating the success of something that happened in, the, in this long process. People have mixed feelings about this. Today's article highlights people working toward its development. Here are some other viewpoints and related coverage. That's not complicated. It's not hard to do, but it's not in journalists' normal processes. The Gazette in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, has started to put boxes like this with stories that say, here's how we reported this. We believe you deserve to know the ins and outs of this plan because your tax dollars will be used to fund it. It includes their motivation for doing a story. It also, it also serves as a compelling invitation to consume the story. Here's why this should matter to you. Here's why it matters to us. We've paid close attention to this. As the reporter on this story, I've attended all the public inset, input sessions since December 2016. We've invested a lot. They also have, um, as part of the, the metrics for our work, trying to tell how people respond, they've started to put buttons underneath this that says, was this information helpful to you? This sort of behind the scenes and just a simple helpful or not helpful button. The Coloradoan in Fort Collins was getting, noticing a lot of comments complaining about crime coverage and making a lot of assumptions about how they decided what, what crimes to cover. And, and so, you know, complaints about a sensational approach, complaints about whether the, how they checked their facts. So they wrote a story. Here's how we report on crime. Um, we, there's no way we could write about every crime. Here are, here are some of the factors. Before we decide to write any crime story, we always gather all available court and arrest documents. 
So now they have something they can link to every single time somebody complains about that. David Fernhold won a Pulitzer at the Washington Post for his coverage of um, candidate Trump's finances. And he wrote about how, um, in an interview with the Pointer Institute, he said that he, it was important to him to have a transparent process. He basically kept a yellow legal pad listing all of the places that candidate Trump said he had donated money. And then this reporter took it on himself to fact check each of those, basically to go to each of those organizations and say, did you get this money? Can you confirm for me? Because he had this transparent process, readers and people around the country were helping him report. Oh, I'll track down that. Oh, I know someone who works there. Oh, you're missing that. You're trying to figure out what that money would have gone for. I, I wrote a check that looked like that last year. Let me help you. And what he said in an interview is that the transparent process builds trust because it shows here's what I'm trying to figure out. I never said I'm trying to prove Donald Trump wrong. I'm trying to prove Donald Trump right. He said he gave this money to charity. Help me find evidence that it's true. I wanted to show people that I'm not starting out trying to prove a negative. I'm inviting them to help me just collect facts. The Washington Post, this is not a newsroom working with me. I'm just, they've done a lot of really great work recently that uh, I'm not taking credit for. I'm just highlighting. They have a new video series called How to Be a Journalist, and they take people behind the scenes. This was a video interview with the reporters who worked on the Roy Moore story. And there's definitely a widespread view among a segment of conservatives that that was a, a, a media conspiracy to bring down Roy Moore in his Senate candidacy in Alabama. This reporter is actually from Alabama, and she does a really wonderful job explaining how the tips came in, how many people they talked to, the just absolutely rigorous process they went, went through in fact-checking. And it would be very hard to get through this video, I think, and believe that they, they were politically motivated in their reporting. Unfortunately, a lot of the people who believe that um, probably wouldn't watch the video. But some people who are wondering just might watch it. Another one of their videos interviewed people about what it's like to cover... Um, mass shootings. Way too many people on their staff have a lot of experience at this point covering mass shootings. So they absolutely humanized and gave a face and some tears to what it feels like to be a journalist in that situation. Another really important strategy we're working on is labeling content types. So most of the time when we turn on 24-hour news, we see something like this. How easy is it to tell who among those people is a journalist, who is a staff analyst or sort of host, who is a paid expert source, I often cannot tell. And the blurring of the lines. We have to remember that when people say, oh, all journalists do these days is share their own opinions, this is often what they have in mind. But it trickles down into what journalists and local <laughs> communities are doing. We also need to work on, um, man, being human beings. And when people ask us questions, answering them. And when people wonder who we are and where our credibility lies and how we know the things that we know, we are not above criticism and questioning. And we absolutely has to be part of our job and part of our mindset that we owe people an explanation and that we owe people an answer to their questions. So we need to tell people. Several people in our user interviews said that they regularly click through to author bios on websites and figure out who those people are. What makes you the right to tell me this? Um, you know, what, what did you study? How long have you been covering this? Why should I trust you? We also need to show that we're listening. We need to take responsibility for conversations that are hosted on our social media or on our website. We need to be present. And when people ask questions about our journalism, we need to remember that in answering them, we're not just answering them, we're also speaking to all the other people who will read that comment thread. And it's amazing to me how often journalists miss the opportunity to explain what they do. Stand up for civility, enforcing our comment policies. And then when you get ideas in from your readers, when people call in or email in with ideas, or when people leave a comment with ideas for a story, give public credit to that. Show that you're listening by saying, this story idea came from a reader. This is a reporter at WUSA in Washington, DC, who's been working with us. And he did an eight minute story, which is long for TV news, an eight minute story about stop and frisk laws in DC. And he started off by standing on a corner in the neighborhood where he grew up, 
and inserted himself into the story by saying, I've lived here a long time and here's what I've noticed about what's changing. In the middle of all that, he also um, gave an explanation of his process. He was very clear to say, here are the number of times and the methods in which I tried to get the police chief on the record. Here are the records I read through to do this. Here are the databases I used. Um, and here is my email address and phone number in case you have questions about this or have more ideas for what you'd like me to follow up on throughout the story. It's not a specific tagline. It's not a separate box with a story. But the language used throughout the story was very much about you deserve to know how the, who I am and how this was done. Being accessible also means showing that you're listening and holding people accountable for the way that they talk and for being a good human being. The Fresno Bee worked with us on some strategies on Facebook specifically around building trust. Check out the reaction they got when someone was just a jerk about this 11-year-old girl who was chosen to be on a national cooking show. Like, that's pretty cool, right? I have never been on a national cooking show. She's pretty rocking, I would say. Andre comes in and says, Wiz, what culinary arts school did she attend and graduate? So Andre did not violate a comment policy. He doesn't need his comment deleted. He's just being a jerk about a kid. So most journalists would just let that go. Like, what are you going to do? Maybe some other readers would, would challenge him. But what are you going to do? The Fresno Bee took another approach and said she's 11 and she's been invited onto a national cooking show. That seems pretty impressive. And they got 51 likes on that comment because people appreciate that they stood up for civility. People appreciate that they did not let him get away with saying that. They responded like a human being. They didn't respond like a brand messaging or like a marketing department would have responded. They responded like, like they said what you wanted to say. Maybe they didn't go quite as far as what I would want to say. Here's another example of responding to questions about reporting. Newsy, which has a large audience for their video coverage, uh, was doing a story about oil pipelines when, when they were testing with me. And they saw a lot of questions about why they used American Indians instead of Native Americans in their coverage. And they said, um, so they asked the reporter, why did we do that? And they said, basically, the best thing to do is refer to people by their specific tribe. But there were a lot of tribes represented here, so we couldn't do that. We asked people there what their preference was. We asked our, the people we were interviewing what their preference was. We also consulted Associated Press style. And here's the decision we came up with. 627 people liked that comment. So they liked that for a variety of reasons. They liked that there was a thoughtful explanation behind it. They liked that they took the time to answer and that they heard in the reporter's own words about the decision. Maybe they liked it because they agreed with the decision. Either way, most journalism wouldn't do this. Most journalism would let the question go by. It didn't take a long time to do, and it did a lot to build trust. So some of what I'm showing you, for those of you who've worked in newsrooms and read journalism job descriptions, um, and a lot of the journalists I pitch these ideas to, it's not that, it's, it's not that the strategies are, um, are hard to wrap our brain around from a philosophical perspective. Like, sure, of course we should be responsive. Of course we should answer questions about our process. It's that we can't picture doing it. And we're really uncomfortable with how we would have to change our routines or our processes or our mindset in order to do it. But a trust level at 32% also does not feel comfortable. And the number is just getting worse. So uh, my sincere hope is that journalists will decide it's part of their jobs to actively earn trust, to anticipate their news consumers' questions and complaints and misassumptions, and to consider it part of their job to combat that and to demonstrate their own credibility. Thank you very much.